Smartcast. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. How to get 30, 30, how to get 30, how to get 20, 20, 20, how to get 20, 20, how to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month? So Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows. Full terms at mintmobile.com. Most business owners are like, oh, yeah, I got funnels. And then you should start asking about the numbers. And then fewer folks actually know the numbers. And then if you're like, well, let's see the numbers, then like no one actually wants to show you the numbers because it's not like in a spreadsheet or a dashboard or a system, right? So if you're not tracking it, how can you improve it? Welcome to Think Business with Tyler, sharing our methods and strategies for success. Join in on our conversations with business owners as we highlight their triumphs and detail how they overcame the challenges they faced while continuing to grow and scale their business. It's time to think life, think success, and think business with your host, Tyler Martin. Hey there, entrepreneurs. Welcome to another episode of Think Business with Tyler. I'm your host, Tyler Martin, and today I've got a great conversation lined up for you with Jeremy Shapiro. We dive deep into the power of tracking and analyzing your funnel numbers, and Jeremy's insights could revolutionize how you view your business performance. Jeremy's got some golden advice on building a team to combat burnout without falling into the perfectionism trap. Plus, we'll also uncover the hidden benefits of mastermind groups and how they can trigger those game-changing business breakthroughs. And now, let's dive into the episode. Hey, Jeremy, welcome to the Think Business with Tyler podcast show. How's it going? Awesome, thank you. So glad to be here. I'm glad to have you. Hey, I've got all kinds of questions ready for you, but before I dive into those, I'd love to learn a little bit about you. First, let's start with what do you do professionally? So all of my businesses over the past number of decades have been in the service and support of entrepreneurs. Um, Entrepreneurship has been my entire career, and it's a great place to play because I feel this is what helps people to reach true entrepreneurial freedom. So these days, a lot of the work that I do is in the form of facilitating mastermind groups. So at the Bay Area Mastermind, we have uh, monthly full-day mastermind groups where our members get to work on their business instead of just in their business. Very cool. And then I'd love to learn something about you personally. Is there something you could share with us, uh, your personal life, things you like, anything you want to share? Yeah, I'm, I'm an avid cyclist. I will ride unreasonably long distances for you know excellent craft coffee and vegan pastries in fact, one of the wonderful parts about entrepreneurial freedom is that you know every Thursday, uh, you know, is when I go on good long rides. I'm with other fellow founders, and you know we're offline, you know, on bikes, um, having coffee and good eats, uh, you know, faraway places, and uh, and also, of course, on weekends, a classic Saturday rides and all too. But it's by far one of my passions, and uh, that gets me to my coffee and uh, and vegan eats. That's hilarious. I'm curious, what's the longest you've rode in one in one shot? Once a year, there's an event called a flesh. It, has origins in France and all. And it's a 24 hour ride. Um, it's usually just under 400 kilometers and, uh, you and your team descend in on one central place. You leave at like 7 AM on Saturday and you arrive in, you know, the following morning all to the central spot, getting to celebrate and hang out with everyone else who's done the same thing coming from further away. So that was, I think just under 400 kilometers. Otherwise, uh, I've competed and set course records on the silver state 508, which is a race across the loneliest highway in the country, us 50 across Nevada. And so we race for time across the state and back, but that's at elevation. So you're already in the high desert, but then it also climbs. So it's 508 miles and it has 28,000 feet of climbing and it's a nonstop event. So you're going from the hundred plus degree, you know, hot Nevada desert weather into the, you know, freezing or below freezing temperatures at night, high up in the mountains. It's an endurance race. And we've uh, competed and set course records on that on fixed gear bikes. So with, uh, with no gearing and none of that, just one gear. Does cash flow have you down? Profit, not where you think it should be? Maybe it's the long hours. Let's meet to see if I can help. I bridge driving the financial performance of your business to hit growth and success targets. Book a complimentary meeting at meetforgrowth.com to get started now. Once again, that's meetforgrowth.com. I look forward to talking with you. And thanks for listening to the show. It's an endurance race, and we've uh, competed and set course records on that on fixed gear bikes. So with, uh, with no gearing and none of that, just one gear. 
Wow, that that's hardcore. I love when I get people like you that do these hardcore things. I had someone on my show yesterday and she actually said she signed up for one of these races. And I said, oh, really? She said, yeah, there's a 5K, a 10K, a run race, 5K, yeah. 10K, a uh, half marathon and a marathon. And she said, yeah, I signed up for all four. And I said, so you literally did one each day? And she's all, yeah, I did. I did all four, one each day. And I'm like, wow, that's hardcore. I love it. <laughs> You know, it's funny, like the overlaps between like, you know, endurance, competitive athletics and business like are just uncanny, right? There's this idea of something happens. You just give up and pack it or do you go home uh, or do you keep going? Um, like just this past weekend, we had a, a local uh, road cycling event here. And last year, this event, it was like, you know, in the 90s, baking sun, climbing up, you know, these gorgeous climbs and all. And this year it was like sideways freezing rain. And so, you know, I'm on course on this climb in the middle of the mountains going up this road uh, and the rain's just dumping down and I flat and I'm like, oh, like, you know, okay, like it's fine. It happens. So, you know, I'm over changing out the tube, getting my, you know, everything back together and it takes a little longer. It's a little more challenging when it's, you know, when you're shaking and freezing in the rain and, you know, changing this out, but we do. And I get like, no, sir, no, do I get a mile further and it's flat again? And like, I've checked everything. I know how to do this. And like, no joke, it's like three flats. And after the third, I'm like, okay, like the conditions, everything are saying, forget it. But at that point, I'm like, or what else do we do? You keep doing the same thing again, getting the same result. Well, try something different. Um, so at this point, I'm like, clearly, this is not a tube issue. And we cannot find whatever's in the tire here causing this problem. New tire time. So we throw a new tire on there and we're able to keep going. But my gosh, if that does not parallel to business and the setbacks we encounter and doing the same thing and not moving ahead again and again, uh, you know, I don't know what it is. So I love those parallels. Yeah. And I love how you segue into that. I want to, let's start with how did you get into running a business, owning a business? And then how does that convey into you actually supporting business owners? Yeah. So I started my first businesses, like real businesses back in high school. And it was wonderful because that was something I could do sort of off hours and sometimes wink during school hours as well. In fact, I even got like independent study where I got to like run my business during school hours, um, which was fantastic. So that was really great. And that brought me through into university. And at that point, I found my business was growing and scaling that I was both trying to attend university full time and, you know, run a business that at this point was taking up 40 hours a week of my time. So I made a really unpopular decision to put school on pause. I'm like, you know, it's just a little bump, a little uptick in business, and then like I'll come back to school. And uh, as my wife will tell you, she and I met shortly after that time. When I first heard, told her the same thing about going back to school, she took one look at me and already knew. She's like, yeah, this, this guy's not going back. And she's, to this day, still not wrong. Um, I haven't gone back. But it's been good. You know, I was able to build out the team and build the business and have done that again and again since. Um, and really, all these businesses have been in the service of other business owners and entrepreneurs. Everything has always been B2B, primarily working with the business owner and helping them to you know, build their business and themselves find entrepreneurial freedom. Yeah, very cool. So let, let's talk a little bit about burnout, because that's something that comes up a lot is, you know, as entrepreneurs, we become burned out and that can be early in your, in your venture, or it can be uh, as you're scaling and getting large. What are your thoughts? Cause you get, you have such a unique perspective. You see so many business owners and so many entrepreneurs. What are your thoughts around burnout? What do you, any, any tips or action items in terms of how we can avoid it or deal with it? Yeah. There's been a whole movement of like this hustle movement, which like is so toxic. And thankfully, there's been a bit of a backlash to that. And we now have sort of the anti-hustle movement. And I'm strongly more on the anti-hustle side. See, the hustle movement is all around this like toxic idea that like while you're sleeping, your competition is out there taking away your business and building up theirs to put you out of business. And any moment you're not spent, you know, taking on new territory, someone else is taking it away from you. And it's this really scarcity mindset approach to everyone's out to eat your lunch. And I don't know, but like when you hear those things, that doesn't bring you joy and fulfillment in life, does it? Right? Like this toxic approach to hustle, hustle, hustle. So I'm a big believer in your business is meant to support you and what you want to do in life and in your community and you know in, in the world, right? So if what you want is a 90 hour a week job, right, with none of the perks of having a job and all of the liabilities and challenges of having a business, then sure, go after that. But that very, very quickly leads to burnout. And I've seen that time and time and time again, 
right? So, you know, one of our mastermind members, for example, he came into our group and uh, when we started talking, we found out that his business was, was at a point where so much of it still blocked on him. And this was a guy who loved mountain biking, loved hiking, being in the outdoors, and he couldn't do those things because if a customer needed something, it needed him. And so when the business blocks on just you, then you can never step away from the business to be part of your community, to help out with your family, to really spend those quality years we have on this earth doing what matters most to you. And so we helped him to build out a team. So now he had people there to be on that front line. That got him his time back. That was time he could use to work on the business. That was time he could use to get out in the outdoors, which was restorative, which was good for his mental health, his physical health, and everything. Right. So when you build the business beyond just yourself or so it's less dependent upon you, you get the freedom of time back, which is entrepreneurial freedom. You can then choose not only how to spend your time, but how much time you spend and where. So building a team, I hear I hear you loud and clear. Like that's one of the steps that can get you free from this burnout and allow you to work on your business. Having said that, one of the things that oftentimes business owners will say is, okay, I've gotten to, let's say, a million dollars of revenue, and I'm kind of doing almost everything. I'm wearing tons of hats, and I do have a couple employees, but employees are a pain in the butt. They quit. They don't show up. I can't find people that actually want to own it. What's your thoughts around that, and how do you overcome that? Yeah, so there's a few pieces here, right? One is it's not just about having people, right? You can't just throw bodies at a problem and have it solve itself, right? So you want to make sure you have your systems and then you have the people to operate those systems. And your systems aren't just a done set thing, set and forget. This is an iterative process that you revise as you go along, right? So I'll share an example of that with you. A fun exercise we do sometimes um, when we're talking operations and systems is I'll ask our unsuspecting business owners to write down and create the system for how to create a cup of coffee. And they do. And Then we get to go through and say, okay, so if we hand this to someone, you're going to get the cup of coffee of your dreams. And typically in their mind, it's a yes. And then we get to just like tear apart the system and find all the holes in it uh, and all the areas where it can go wrong from our vast experience of running businesses and seeing people, you know, miss the mark on systems. So when you have a system and you have someone trained on and using that system and you don't get the result that you want, and this happens a lot, we iterate. And that's usually for one of three reasons. One is the person didn't follow the system, right? So that's a person problem. You, we can retrain, we can work with them on that, coach them, et cetera, right? Two is it was a system problem, right? Meaning you didn't define it well enough or you didn't articulate what it was or you missed communicating something important in there. And that's like most common one in the beginning, right? And the third is something just wasn't clear. How you interpreted it and how the team interpreted it were different. And so you just clarify what that is, right? So Think of all the times you've seen things go wrong with your team within your own business, right? It's going to be one of those three categories. And so we simply just iteratively work on those systems. And then, of course, making sure that people are using those systems correctly. So the big mindset you know, blocks I see for business owners as they want to scale are spot on to what you're saying about you know, building out that team, right? So let's assume you got your systems in place and you figured that out, and now you know that you want to hire, Right. One mindset challenge I see from you know, typically smaller businesses is this perfectionist approach where a business owner feels no one can do something as well as they can, right? You know, we can call this the artist, right? There's a style they have and it's that you can't document the way I do things. Well, you can't scale the business without doing that. So when you figure out what your definition of success is and you know how to, to specify what the outcome should be, you can communicate that, train people on it and have them hit that done right, you'll get an outcome from your team that you're proud to put your name on. And if it's not, well, then we go back and revise the system or the person or so on, right? The second big challenge that I see from time to time is this concern of if you document the system and you show someone how to operate your business, they're going to go out there and open up the Pepsi tier Coke and be competing with you and put you out of business, right? That again comes to that scarcity mindset we were talking about earlier that if we are able to move beyond that and recognize most folks are looking for a job, a contract, a gig, and so on, and they're not one of us weirdos who actually wants to have a business, then you know that frees up a lot of that concern. The second thing is in the rare case, someone does decide to go out there and open up a competing business, the likelihood of them actually building a real competitor to you is low. The employee mindset and business owner mindset are vastly different. 
many technicians who go out there and go to open their own business quickly realize, and you relate to this as well, our listeners, that there's a whole lot more to running a business than just doing the work of the business. And for most folks, they're just not, you know, cut off for that. So that's really not a concern. And worst case, in the rare offset chance they go out there and open the competing business, is it truly going to compete with you? You are always a moving target. You have your brand, you have your team, you have your systems outside of what they know, and you are evolving and changing. They're going to open up something different. It's going to find their flavor and style. And even if it does compete with you head to head, is that a bad thing or do you get better from that? So once you get past a few of those mindset you know, shifts, then you're on your way to having systems and the right team to run them. And that lets you scale the business and reduce the number of hours that you have to put into the business. Not saying you shouldn't, but you don't have to. Yeah. I want to go back to the setting up systems and then having a, an employee take it over. I've heard different things. So the, I love how you brought up the perfectionist attitude because I think a lot of times owners will, you know, they just, I can't do it. Nobody can do it as good as me. And then I've heard some people say, well, you shouldn't expect them to do it as good as you. If they can do it 80% as good, you should be happy with that. It sounds like you're saying though, if we do the system with, we set up systems, really you can replicate the result that the owner should get. What's your, th I mean, what's your feeling one when you hear the 80% is good enough versus if you have systems and you probably should be pretty close to, I mean, what's your thoughts around that? So the short answer is it depends, right? Okay. If you think about heart surgeons, do you want a heart surgeon just given 80%? <laughs> probably not, right? Probably not. Yeah. Now on the flip side, if you look at Starbucks, right, there's a business with systems and scaling and all of that. You are never going to go into a Starbucks and get a latte with latte art done on top. They just don't do it. In fact, if you're a barista who worked at a cafe and does traditional classic latte art, which is not difficult to do with the right training, and you show up at Starbucks and try and pull that crap, like they're going to tell you right, right quick, like, no, you just put the foam on, you give it to the customer. You don't do the artwork on top. Why is that? Well, it's additional skills and training and more can go wrong. And it's harder to get a consistent output between baristas around the world. So in that case, they adjust the standard to what is repeatable and scalable. And so there's no artwork, right? A smaller cafe can set the bar higher and they can say, we are hiring fewer higher skilled workers who we can train to do the Rosetta or you know any of these kinds of things on top of your latte and have it be more or less consistent every time, but still to a standard they're happy with. So look at what it is and where that outcome is defined and ask yourself how important that is to the customer versus your own ego, how trainable or scalable it is and what you can do with it. Yeah. What are your thoughts in terms of as a company scaling? So they're getting bigger. They've done an okay job of delegating. So they've got employees, but there gets to a point where they need to start to think about like a leadership team. Maybe they start as managers and they go into leadership team. What, what's your feeling like? What should that look like? Like, is there a certain level of revenue, a certain size? I mean, do you have any like general guideline of when that leadership team should show up? Yeah. So if you look at the parts of your business, right? Everyone's business model is a little different. Some are very heavy sales operations. Some are very heavy on the operation side. Some are heavy on the marketing, right? Like you're going to find your style for your business, right? And one thing I find so fascinating is in our mastermind groups, we have businesses that are lumpy in different areas and not, and that's not a bad thing, right? So it's fascinating to me, like the, the different challenges that people come in with and some are thematic, but there's sort of different themes that can come in. So some people, their business has plateaued and the challenge they're facing is like, how do I get more leads, right? How do I grow my business? I just, if I only had more leads, my business would be bigger, right? So that's one common plateau. But then the flip side, we have some business owners who come in and like, this one fascinates me. They're like, oh my gosh, like we have too many leads. You know, our operations are falling apart. We can't get back to customers. We can't get our invoices and quotes out and handle the sales calls. Like, you know, we're doing terrible there. But like when we have a customer, we do a great job on the fulfillment side, right? So like you facilitate that conversation and one business is saying, well, how do you, how are you getting so many leads? I want that. And the other business saying, how are you handling all these leads and onboarding them so well? Because we can't do that. And so you get that true exchange of ideas in that mastermind created by more than one business owner. So you're going to find in your business, there's different stress points. And there's, um, if you've ever read the goal, the goal is all around the theory of constraints, right? This comes from like a manufacturing you know, uh, background, but it applies to so many areas of our business. And what we do is we iteratively apply 
this theory of constraints to your business to find where is like the worst performing piece. And we focus on that. We work on that. And then a different part will reveal it to be the worst performing part. And so you go through the iterative process, right? So for, you know, for an example business, let's say you've got three sales reps, but there's no head of sales, right? That might be working fine and there's no problem over there. Yet you might find on your operation side, you have, you know, 10 people out in the field and there's, you know, you're managing them. Well, maybe that's a good spot to hire and bring in some management, right? Whereas if someone else is different, somebody else's business, it might be the complete opposite. So you're going to see sort of what feels right. Um, in the EMA 3 visited, Michael Gerber, if you haven't read that, is a fantastic read. But one of the things that, you know, that we go over with our members from there is creating the sort of the org chart for the business as you think it should be and defining what those responsibilities are. And in a smaller business, people, they will have their name in multiple boxes. If you're a solopreneur, your name's in all the boxes. As you start to grow, you'll have a few different team members, but it's not one name per box. You have the roles in your org chart and people's names in the jobs that they're doing. Okay. So as you hire, what you're typically doing is you're taking out an existing team member's name from a box of their many boxes or their many hats, and you're putting in a new hire's name into some of those boxes. And the larger you get, the more specialization you have, right? So you might bring on someone to help out with marketing. And that might cover 17 different boxes on your org chart that have to do with marketing. As you grow, you might have someone who all day long is on SEO and someone else is all day long in PPC and someone all day long on channel partners and so on, right? And those are all part of the marketing team. And then at some point you have someone overseeing that. I'll share an example of that. Um, and one of our members, they had a growing uh, SaaS business. They were doubling revenue year over year. And the business owner from the beginning was doing a lot of the marketing. And the business owner was doing a, a good job at it right? Good enough. The business was growing, but it was also a lot of time. And so they had brought on a writer full-time to help out with content and writing as a team member, but the business owner still spent a lot of time in marketing. So one thing we often talk about is hiring people who are smarter than you, right? Surround yourself by those who are smarter and can do things better than you can. And so this business owner brought on um, a chief marketing officer, a CMO. That's not cheap, but suddenly this business owner got to spend like an hour a week at most in marketing, right? It was now more managerial. And the CMO like skyrocketed that company because they were now managing a team, building out the team and doing a lot of groundwork to bring in new customers to a recurring revenue business. Uh, was able to build that up quite a bit. Now, when the pandemic hit, one of the first jobs that you know need to be cut from a budget standpoint from looking forward was they downsized and actually removed that role. Now, that's not great from a job standpoint, but from a business standpoint, those years of customers that, that had built up are all recurring revenue customers. So those flywheels kept going and continued to bring in revenue. All the work that that CMO had done and the team that was established and so on continued to produce long tail, right? And then, you know, as things emerged, the business was able to grow in other ways and such beyond that. So hire folks who are smarter than you, find out where, you, where you're spending the most time or what's the most disorganized, and that'll help you to figure out management wise where to you know what needs management and don't just have management for management's sake but have your leaders leading the parts of your organization that matter most and that need the leadership for you if you're a business owner feeling stuck in your business overwhelmed responsible for everything that happens and working long hours tyler helps his clients develop processes hire high performing team members and better understand their financial metrics and numbers to allow for a more predictable less hands-on business to schedule a free, no pressure consultation, head to thinktyler.com and click the meeting button. Tyler would love to see if he can help you work on your business, not in your business. Schedule a consultation today at thinktyler.com. Think life, think success, think business. And don't just have management for management's sake, but have your leaders leading the parts of your organization that matter most and that need the leadership for you. Yeah, very interesting. Great, great answer. Hey, what do you see in your masterminds since you deal with so many entrepreneurs? What are the common roadblocks? I mean, what are the things that come up the most? Is We talked about staffing, so I'm going to assume that's probably one, but what, what are the things that you see the most? Yeah, it, it's funny. So when we have folks who come in and join us for a mastermind test drive, this yeah. is where they get a chance to join us for the day and be a member for a day with us and get a feeling for what it's like and have their own dedicated hot seat and be part of everyone else's hot seat. 
our folks come in and join us for a test drive and they have an idea of what they know they know. These are their core competencies, their expertise, their so on, uh, their superpowers, right? They also generally have like a big burning question, something that's keeping them up at night, something that, you know, if you close your eyes and thought about it, you're like, if I, if I solve this one thing, like my business would just grow and grow, right? That's like their big burning question. And that's what they know they don't know. But there's this whole vast area of that knowledge of what you don't know you don't know. And when you put yourself in a mastermind environment, that's where you get to hear everyone else's hot seats as well. And not just in a broadcast presentation format, but an interactive conversation. So when other members are sharing about what's going on in their business, you get unblocked in ways you didn't realize you were blocked because suddenly your worldview is getting rocked. You might view there's one way to, to, to grow a business, one channel that works well for you, and another business owner is sharing an area they're seeing success that you had no idea existed. So you get to ask questions around that, dig in, find the resources, the vendors, the best practices, and all those things. And it was something you didn't even know you didn't know. So the biggest pivots, the biggest growth, the best new businesses, the biggest aha moments and breakthroughs, time and time again, come not from the question that you have or from the, the things you know that you don't know but really from that whole land of opportunity of what you didn't know you didn't know. So when you surround yourself with like-minded individuals who are openly sharing behind closed doors about what's working and what's not, that's where you get unblocked in ways you didn't even know you're blocked. Do you see any theme though in terms of things that are coming up that P that business owners are also, you know, typically getting stuck at? Anything yeah. you can share? Any, any maybe like the top three or something? Yeah, so um, our businesses are built of all kinds of funnels. Okay. Right. Like, you know, you know, I'm in the sixth sense, like the, the, I see dead people, right? Like I look at businesses and like, I see funnels, they're everywhere. And so, <laughs> you know, when we look at a business and talk about funnels, people typically think marketing funnels or sales funnels, right? You have someone you know, view your ad, click on your ad, end up on your website, opt in, buy your stuff, buy an upsell and so on. You have a funnel. We all know those, but these funnels are everywhere in our business. When you're hiring, you have a hiring funnel, whether you know it or not. Better that you document it and actually have a conscious funnel than not. When you have team members, you typically want to have a career ascension funnel. You probably don't have, have that documented, but you should, right? You can have that as a roadmap. When you hire someone, they see what the career plan is, where they are now, what the next steps are, what they need to get there, what the new responsibilities and expectations are at that level, and so on. So you have a funnel there. You have funnels on your sales side of things, right? If you think about a traditional sales team funnel, these are just everywhere in your business. So the big challenges that come up thematically are typically a, a blockage or a poor performing part of one of these funnels. So one of those examples we see is on the hiring side. You shared this earlier, the challenges of where do you find the right people and how do you qualify the right candidates and how do you get them on board and train them up and sort of those, those employee team member onboarding challenges. We see that one commonly. Another big one is at the, is the top of funnel on the marketing side, right? Getting in front of more of your prospects and filling that calendar with sales calls or filling that shopping cart, you know, your, your CRM with new, you know, e-commerce customers and so on. So is on the, is on the top of funnel on the marketing side of things is a big one as well. And then the last one that we see from time to time is on the operations side is this idea of creating the right systems, organizing those systems, hiring and training and building around those, and then having a business of systems and not just a business of you and some key people. So how does a, a business owner, what can they do to look at their funnels and try to spot where they have a problem? Like short of like going to a mastermind or hiring a coach or something, are there some things that they could do that like they could go, hey, yeah, please take over. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. It's funny, this came up so often. I actually put together like, I ran like a free webinar online for our members and the community of like, you know, let's talk marketing funnels, right? Because what I found is like, I would talk about this stuff and see a lot of head nods, like, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And then like, it wouldn't get done. And like, I'm a tactical guy. I like to get stuff done. Let's not just talk about it, let's do it. So I built out like an example spreadsheet. It's a free Google sheet you can copy and use it for your, for your own business. But we break down like, what is the funnel? And then let's start tracking it because most business owners are like, oh yeah, yeah, I got funnels. And then you start asking about the numbers and then fewer folks actually know the numbers. And then if you're like, well, let's see the numbers, then like no one actually wants to show you the numbers because it's not like in a spreadsheet or a dashboard or a system, right? So if you're not tracking it, how can you improve it? So the first thing we do is we figure out what are your funnel steps? Then we actually 
track the real numbers within the funnel. Then we can look at the conversions along the way. And if you're really good and we're actually doing, uh, we're actually looking at, at ad spend, for example, or money spent, we can run that all the way down the funnel and look at what it costs to get someone onto your website, what it costs to get them to opt in, what it costs for them to schedule a call with you, what it costs for them to become a new customer, and so on. And those numbers are so informative because once we know what they are, we've got a baseline. And once we've got a baseline, then we can start to test things to improve. Not all of our tests are successful. Some of them we'll find make a number worse, right? And a classic example of this I'll give you is you start working with a marketing agency. Now, if the marketing agency doesn't own the funnel all the way down, but just the very tippity top, what you'll see, and oh my gosh, do I see this a lot, is an agency fills your funnel with leads, <laughs> right? And they're looking at you and they're saying, we are doing amazing because we drove traffic and we got opt-ins and you spent this much. But then you look further down the funnel and they're garbage leads. Right, you're getting you know the hotmail addresses written all caps. You're getting you know these throwaway nonsense email addresses from like not even real people. You just get junk stuff coming through where they're grossly unqualified because the agency doesn't own the funnel to the bottom, right? So when we look at the funnel holistically and we start looking at the results, you'll see that you brought on the agency and your lead quantity went up, but maybe your number of new customers went down or stayed flatline. What that probably means is your cost per lead maybe went down, but your cost per customer just skyrocketed, right? So that's where we say, okay, that's a failed test. Let's either rewind this or refine it, right? So refining could be could be could mean looking at that uh, ad and saying, oh, we didn't target our audience well enough, or our landing page didn't didn't disqualify hard enough, and so you start dialing that in until you find we use the theory of constraints here to find the worst performing part of your funnel again, right? So if we look through your funnel and we see that a common one I see is that once you get someone on the phone for a scheduled call, especially if you're like a service provider, right? You're probably pretty good at closing those sales. You probably see like a, you know, a 50 to 80% close rate once they're on a call. That one's usually good. But in many businesses, if you have, you know, uh, lower quality leads, they might book a call, but not show up for the call. And if you've got like a 30% show rate, that sucks, right? Like mm -hmm. that is a, a really weak part in your funnel. And there's a lot you can do. Sometimes it's super easy stuff, like just put an email phone reminder in there to remind folks to show up for the call and you boost that up, right? And so we improve that part because any part of the funnel you improve improves the results all the way down below, right? So we can improve that show rate. Or maybe in your funnel, what you have is you realize you have a ton of views on your page, but like a really low opt-in rate. So then we look at what do we do to improve the page to either get better targeted traffic, right? Or have a better offer that resonates more or find congruency between the ad and the landing page, the offer and so on. And so we just iteratively look at what's the worst performing part of the funnel. What can we test to try and improve that? And then we take the wins. If you even see like a little 1% improvement in one area, but you continue to stack that, those little 1% add up because those little improvements aren't additive, they're actually multiplicative. So each little one builds, it's like the beautiful rule of compounding interest, right? You make these little changes and you keep doing that and you actually get a significantly better result. So long as that is the mentality and process to always be iteratively working, you know, working on improving the funnels. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. Hey, I wanna talk about masterminds a little bit. So you've run a mastermind for many, many years. I think it's 2017, is that right? Yeah, and I've been part of masterminds even longer. So yeah, it's uh, it's been decades of masterminding. Yeah, actually 2008, I think my notes say. So wow, that is like a long time to run a, a mastermind. I mean, that's it's an it's a interesting thing. I'm curious, can you talk about, so like what is the benefit of the mastermind? Who's a fit for a mastermind? How often do they happen? Those types of questions. Yeah, so I found masterminds in my experience typically fall into one of sort of three time buckets, right? And then two leadership buckets, right? So you have on the one end, of the spectrum, your high-end destination masterminds, right? And I've been part of these and you hand over like brand new car size checks per year to be part of these groups. Like I'm talking like five to six figure size checks per year to be part of them. Yeah, crazy, crazy money, yeah. Right, but you head off somewhere, you know, maybe two or three times a year uh, and you're offline for the better part of a week, usually for a few days of masterminding. And those are fantastic. They are, they are great. I've been a part of those. I've written those uncomfortable checks before. 
But the, you know, quote ROI on that has been fantastic for me. I've launched new multi-million dollar businesses from that, had, you know, clients for decades and relationships and all kinds of, you know, friends, everything that have come from those groups. So there's value there. The downside is, you know, A, the financial investment side is, is large, even if the ROI is there. Two is the time commitment. You're typically out of office for the better part of a week, a few times a year. But the biggest piece I've found is if you don't get together for six to nine months between your meetings, you could have an entirely different business, right? It's such a long window from an implementation standpoint. Accountability almost doesn't make sense in a group like that. And when you're talking to someone again, it's rare you're talking about you know these incremental changes. You could be talking about totally new businesses by the time you get together again. So you don't get that shorter feedback loop. On the other end of the spectrum are what I call like your, you know, your coffee shop accountability groups. You might get together a few times, you know, once a week with a few folks, well, maybe on a Zoom call or coffee shop kind of thing for 30 to 90 minutes. There's some social accountability. These are usually free to like, you know, maybe a hundred bucks a month kind of thing. But the turnover is typically pretty high because the skin in the game is so low. Most anything else can be more important than showing up. And it's not a big deal to people if they don't make the meeting, they don't show up. But more importantly is that week-long window is almost too short to implement you know, anything significant in the business, right? It's usually only hyper-tactical at that level. And additionally, in that short period of time, like how deep can we dive into what's going on in your business, right? There's just not a whole lot of time to really deep dive. Um, so right in the middle is where I found that sweet spot. And this is how we run the Bay Area Mastermind. We get together once a month for a full day of working on the business. So this gets each member good deep dive dedicated time to really pull apart the business, talk about what's going on, handle interactive questions and more, and create some real accountability of good items that can move the business forward that can be worked on over the next month, right? That one month window is ideal, right? Um, we also have our community where everyone stays in touch between meetings for, for accountability questions, sharing, and so on. The one day a month is the right amount of time and the right cadence the right financial investment, time investment, personal investment, and so on that we see the most success with, right? And the other category we look at is, you know, what I call guru-led versus peer-led. Guru-led, you've probably seen out there. There's probably a book you read and you like the author. And so you find out the author has a course. So you go by their course. And then from the course, you find out they have a live event. So you fly out to the live event for a few days at the conference or convention. And then they offer like a mastermind group as a sort of a high-end offering. And everyone who's joining is typically joining to hang out with that expert, right? It's sort of the, the, the followers are hanging around to see, you know, if I rub shoulders with them, what's gonna, what kind of success will rub off on me? And you want to be around that leader. It's not so much the group, it's who's leading the group. And those are fine. There's value in those two, but just be in mind, you know, keep in mind why you're there. The other is the peer advisory groups. And then we, we run the Bay Area Mastermind is my role is helping to qualify, make sure we get the right folks into the room. Who, just, who not only will get value from the room, but can bring value to the room. And then to facilitate those conversations among peers, right? Everyone's got their superpowers and everyone has their sort of weak spots. And so by building the right mix of members in the room, we can get that gorgeous cross-pollination of ideas that happens between members when we have those facilitated conversations and those hot seats for each person in the room. So I much prefer that style of group because I see the collective knowledge of the mastermind formed of the minds in the room more valuable than being around one, you know, one mind that's leading. Does cash flow have you down? Profit, not where you think it should be? Maybe it's the long hours. Let's meet to see if I can help. I bridge driving the financial performance of your business to hit growth and success targets. Book a complimentary meeting at meetforgrowth.com to get started now. Once again, that's meetforgrowth.com. I look forward to talking with you. And thanks for listening to the show. So I much prefer that style of group because I see the collective knowledge of the mastermind formed of the minds in the room more valuable than being around one, you know, one mind that's leading. Yeah, that's interesting. That's that's fascinating. So, hey, I've got three, before we wrap up, I've got kind of three things that stood out to me and feel free to add or edit. First thing that kind of stood out to me was just this whole mindset shift that's needed, which I think we can work on 
anytime immediately. And sometimes we think like, oh, nobody can do it as good as me, like in, in relation to an employee. And we need to shift our minds. So that's one thing that kind of stood out to me as being a big thing. Another thing that I really loved is this concept of a future org chart. Like, where do we want to be? Let's lay out our, our org chart in terms of where we want to be and what seats do people sit at. And then the other big one that I took away, actually, I got way more than three, but these are trying to synthesize it down to three, was know your numbers. Like, really understand your numbers because you can't really make a correction if you don't, if you're not starting with a baseline or something of where you're at. So those are three I got. Anything you want to add, correct, or change? Those are great. I mean, we, we could talk about each of those as an entire podcast, you know, episode, workshop, something, but each of those is like, is, is, is spot on. Those are great. Yeah. You, you added a lot. So, Hey, your, your website is bayareamastermind.com. I'll definitely put those in the show notes at thinktyler.com. Anything else you want to add? I, I've had a thoroughly enjoyed your conversation. A lot of, uh, g- good, juicy info- information that you gave us. Yeah, thank you. The workshops that we're talking about, uh, the interviews, case studies, articles, all those resources are available. Everything I've done has always been in the service of entrepreneurs. And so I I welcome you. Go to our bayareamastermind.com. Take advantage of those resources, the recommended reading, the workshops, the articles, the interviews, the everything that's there. And if you think that, you know, you want to see what a mastermind looks like, then I invite you apply for a test drive, right? There's no like add to cart button. It's simply an application that is insightful as you go through that to uncover things you might not have thought about even in your own business. And then we talk about if there's a fit and there might not be, and that's okay. Um, and we help you figure out, you know, what, uh, what makes the most sense for you in your business. And then Jeremy, are these all in person or do you have any zoom element to this? Yeah, we do. That was actually one of the things from the pandemic for the first time we shifted to a virtual format and actually found that worked really well. So we have, uh, we have both, we have virtual and we also have in person as well. Some folks fly out, others join by zoom. Wow. Do you have any opinion like in terms of the interaction in a room versus Zoom? Like, does it lose a little bit via Zoom or what, what's your thoughts around that? Yeah, we had some time during the pandemic to try and, you know, perfect this model of how do you still get those like hallway conversations, those standing, standing at the coffee, you know, the coffee urn, uh, networking things. And that's much harder in a, in a Zoom environment, but we figured out a fair amount of that. And, you know, we have folks who still get a ton of value in the virtual format. Of course, I'm a big fan of uh, in-person as well. So what some of our members do is they're typically Zoom, but then a few times a year, like they'll fly out and join us so they can get some of that in-person from time to time as well. Yeah, very cool. Hey, well, hey, thank you so much for being on the show. You you added so much uh, by sharing your insights and just can't thank you enough for being here. Thanks for having me. This was really fun. Thanks, take care. That's all for this episode of Think Business with Tyler. But we have plenty more resources to help you in your pursuit of business excellence on our website at thinktyler.com. If you'd like to be featured in a future episode of the show, feel free to reach out to us on social media at think underscore Tyler. We look forward to helping you think life, think success, and think business. Hey there, fabulous souls. I'm Stephanie Baklaan. And I'm Eden Alpert. And we're the hosts of the brand new podcast, Unapologetically Fab. Get ready to join us on an amazing and real journey as we dive into life after 40 and own it. We're all about changing the narrative, leaning into who you are, and living a life by your own design. Join us as we embrace life unapologetically and redefine success. This is Unapologetically Fab. An electric cast production. See you there. Electric cast. Welcome to Transforming 45, the podcast that celebrates the incredible power of passionate voices. I'm your host, Lisa Boat. Join me in conversation with heart-led humans who share their deeply personal stories of transformation. Transforming 45 is here to uplift, connect, and remind you that it's never too late to write your next chapter. So get ready to be inspired, empowered, and transformed. Join me in this community where through powerful storytelling, we heal and reclaim our inherent magic. Electric acid. Electric acid.